Hi everyone, we hope you're all well. Thank you for joining us today. And on behalf of Informa Connect Academy and World at Work, we welcome you to this webinar today. This webinar intends to tell you everything you need to know about the World at Work and the Global Remuneration Professional Credential. I would like to start by telling you about us. We have been in the Middle East for over 30 years. We are part of the Informa Business Group, a FTSE 100 company headquartered in the UK. We've recently rebranded our learning business to Informa Connect Academy, and we are the go-to people for premium professional development experiences in the Middle East, Australia, Asia, the UK, and Europe. Here's a quick overview of the agenda. We will start by sharing an overview of World at Work's global recognition as the standard for the, co the compensation professional and more generally, the broader HR world too. We will then shed some light on the globally recognized GRP credential that comprises 10 courses. Now for the purpose of this webinar today, we have cherry picked three of the courses and we'll go a little bit into detail into, such, into these three courses. Just some housekeeping notes before we start. This webinar is being recorded and we will share the recording with you after the webinar. It's 5 p.m. UAE time now and the webinar will run until 6 p.m. We will take questions at the end of the webinar and we encourage you to type out your questions in the chat. I'd like to now introduce you to our colleague Asil, who manages the World at Work MENA operations. Asil will take you through the introduction to World at Work before passing the floor over to Dr. Mark Basson for the rest of the webinar. We hope you enjoy the webinar. Over to you, Asil. Thank you, Maida, so much. So, hi, everyone. My name is Asil, and I'm the operations, uh, managing the operations of World at Work, Mina. I'm happy to go over an overview of the World at Work and make you aware about the benefits and the dedicated area of the SSB. So, World at Work is an international global organization that mainly specifies in certification, learning, skills, and expertise of social rewards, remuneration. And when we say remuneration, we also refer to the social rewards. We serve those who are responsible for cultivating the productive, inspired, and committed workers in workplaces all around the globe, so it's an international. And also we support in the design and delivery of remuneration, incentive programs, and capabilities with our education and certification, idea exchange, and many other resources that we will go over uh, in our next slide. World at Work has been founded since 1955, it means for more than 57 plus years, we have around 90K members globally worldwide. If you can go back to the previous presentation, please. So what are the dedicated practice areas of World at Work? It's not only about certification, and such as GRP, and other many certification, it's also has a dedicated area that drives success in membership, where there are multiple benefits of being a member of World at Work. Also, the learning, there are multiple courses. We call them as technical courses. There are publications of journals, magazines, and many different publications that members do have access to. There are events we hold each year. The most famous event that we have, which is the Social World Conference, we have each year in the USA. And we have dedicated candidates from the MENA region as well who attend this conference. And there are many other resources such as the salary survey and other resources that members can benefit from. Next last slide, please. So today we will go over the GRP, the designation. Dr. Mark, we will deep dive into the GRP, the courses, and provide you an overview. Just quickly for you to know that the GRP designation, it signifies that you understand the impact of globalization and the region influences on the design and delivery of the global reward program. It also represents that you have the knowledge, the skills, expertise, mainly to uh, administrative based and variable pay programs and effectively communicate the world programs and many others. Next slide, please. So, here are some, I'm going to call them like tactical or technical uh, operational aspects of the global remuneration professional, which is the GRP. The GRP consists of 10 courses, 10 different modules, we call them. 
For each module, candidates need to study and sit for the exam to pass the module, and they will be having a certificate of completion. The validity of each module is 120 days, which means you will get access to the material for 120 days, and you have to sit for the exam within this period. On passing each exam, you will get a certificate of completion. However, you will only be certified if you pass all the 10 modules. The exam is mainly proctored online through a platform called PSI. The exam is two hours, and the number of questions vary depending on each course from 70 to 90 and 50. Also, there is no specific order for you to sit for the course module. Whatever you're comfortable with or you'd like to start with, you can start with any module, but you need to pass all the 10 modules to be certified. The course delivery module is virtual and high flex with Informa. It means it's an online course and it's also an instructor-led course followed by reviews and exams, which is the online exam. Next slide, please. So well, once you are certified as any certification, you need to renew your certification. But this certification credit, they need to be renewed every three years. 12 credits mainly you need to get the recertification that you need uh, or the opportunities or the options that you can uh, have for the recertification. You can find them on World at Work website where you see what options you can have to recertify. If you fail the exam, you are allowed to take the exam as many times as you can. And of course, with an, an additional cost for the exam, because within, once you get the GRC, you will be getting the course material plus the examination itself. Next slide, please. Here is a sneak peek of the certification and also of the certificate of completion. So, certificate of completion is per module, and the certification it is the designation where you are designated with the GRC signed by the world at work. Now I will be handing over it to Dr. Mark. Dr. Mark, I'm sure I trust that Dr. Mark will provide you a great value based on his expertise and the number of years of experience that he has in both rewards and remuneration. Dr. Mark, please go ahead. Thank, thank you, Asil. Um, I'm always very impressed with how you introduce it and uh, you do a great job. So thank you very much. Okay, let's move on. The purpose of my um, talk, and I'll be about 40 minutes and gladly take uh, as many questions as you want, uh, during and after is fine, is to tell you a little bit about the GRP program. So there are 10 courses, as Asil mentioned, and in front of you on the screen are the first five. So GR1 is called Total Rewards Management, and that gives you an overview. It's like the umbrella, and it talks about all the elements of Total Reward, and it delves into how to compile a Total Reward strategy. The second one is Business Acumen, which talks about what you need to know to sit at the C-suite and at the boardroom table. Quantitative Principles is Statistics. Most of us don't like it, so um, I really encourage you to attend uh, in person for that particular course. Um, it's very, very helpful, and we are going to unpack a little bit of that course just to give you a feel what it looks like over the, the next 30 minutes. Um, we've picked three of them, and that's one of them, just to show you what it looks like. The next one is job analysis and documentation, it's job descriptions, it's job evaluation. We talk about the different methods of job evaluation, and it gives you a very good feel for how to do it. Base pay administration talks about salary structures and the architecture and anatomy of a salary structure. For example, pay ranges, pay overlap, midpoint differentials, pay slope, what are the international benchmarks there, and how does one calculate them for one's own organization? Next slide. The next five include market pricing that has to do with salary surveys and what to look out for and how to participate in the surveys. I know many of you are already doing it, but um, you may switch service provider or you may 
switch region. And then um, it's very interesting to see how different entities globally um, slice and dice their compensation. Improving performance of variable pay has to do with short-term incentive design. Um, there is a little bit in there on long-term incentives design, but mostly short-term incentive design. And it's one of my favorite courses because it's got two case studies in there that are really, really, really great. Um, if you leave that course, you will know how to design an incentive plan. International remuneration covers expatriates, impatriates, moving people around the globe. Um, how do you balance it out? And we cover their uh, international compensation. We cover the balance sheet approach and how do you take into account the purchasing power parity, the cost of living. And that's one um, we're also going to unpack a little bit today just to give you a taste to see uh, what it looks like and what's in there. IFRS stands for International Financial Reporting Standards, uh, IFRS for Compensation Professionals. It tells you how to report all the elements of total rule. So your finance colleagues are already doing it, and this builds a bridge between HR and finance. And the last one is strategic communication. Nothing happens without great communication. You can develop the very, very, very best uh, plan, but if you don't communicate it well, it can fall flat. So out of the 10, as I still said, if you get all 10, you get that one certificate you saw earlier, and you can put GRP behind your name. So it's an international qualification. It's the same around the world. So it doesn't matter whether you're in Sydney or Tokyo, London, New York or Riyadh um, or Dubai. Um, it's the same qualification for everybody Thank you for that prompt. So let's start with quantitative principles and have a next slide just to just to have a look at what, what gets covered in there. So firstly, a lot of compensation, we, we call it remuneration in England and Australia, New Zealand, South Africa. So I use the word remuneration and compensation interchangeably. Here, it has to do with... Um, the statistics, the various levels of data and how you treat the various levels of data and the statistical tests on that. Why do we do it? And this slide, thank you for bringing it in. It helps you with much better decision-making. If you're backing it up with statistics, it's very, very good for decision-making. And it's universally applicable. So it doesn't matter whether you are using it only for comp and pen. You can use it for HR. You can use it in finance and marketing and anything else. The strategic insights in the middle really are um, backing it up with, uh, imagine if you can back it up with a standard deviation and quote a number and say, yes, it's statistically significant. So it just takes your compensation management to the next level. Next slide. Okay, so why do we collect data and why do we use it? Um, you can read it for yourself, but the one that I want to focus on here is scenario modeling. If you want to do scenario modeling and say what has the biggest effect on a factory worker's pay? What has the biggest effect on a CFO or CEO pay? In Excel, we teach you how to do the regression analysis, the single regression, the multiple regression, and you can then start predicting with a fair degree of accuracy. You can set the accuracy to whatever you want it to be, like 90 or 95%. Um, what pay should be, what the bonus power should be, what the incentive power should be, what the share plans will eventually come in at. So uh, I'm very, very, very helpful in scenario modeling and planning. Next slide. So most of us get a bit afraid and we say, well, you've got to be a statistician or have a degree in mathematics. No, you don't. This is easy. We make the course easy. It's two full days. You'll sit with a tutor and go through Excel spreadsheets line by line. So we'll show you how to calculate the median, the percentiles, P25, P50, P75, standard deviations, regression analyses, uh, line by line, no problem. We, we're very, very careful with that. Next slide. 
So again, we say, what can you use statistics for? Well, should you pay a sign-on bonus in month one or in year three? Is it better to have 100,000 now or 300,000 in year three? Um, it's, it's those scenario plannings that can apply to any one of these things uh, in front of you. And um, it just makes you sound a lot better when you go to your excos and you come to board levels. Next slide. So one of the biggest things with statistics is when you are being misled, someone's misleading you, or you, by mistake, mislead others. I chair eight boards, and I'm the remuneration committee chairman of a lot of companies, more companies uh, than, than other people I know. And um, when HR and finance uh, and the total ward lead come and present to me, um, they need to get their facts straight. They need to know if they've made a, a blunder or not. And, and I'd like to share two or three slides um, showing you an example of the blunders that could get made. Next slide. So here, if the trade union are presenting to me and they're saying we've had dramatic decreases over time, there've been no salary increases. With your eye, visually, you can see it's tall on the left and it's going down to almost nothing on the right. And you might initially at face value, we call it prima facie evidence. Prima facie evidence is evidence just presented to you and with your eye, you say yes, uh, I agree with you, but if you look at the bottom left on the x-axis, you'll see it starts with number four. Next slide. If you started at zero, which is what you should do, in other words, all your um, data should be incorporated in, in the graph, um, it's not that dramatic anymore. Yes, it's still going down, but but I, would, I wouldn't call it dramatic. So you have no idea how many times um, HR folk come and present stuff to me and um, they've made a, a, a mistake like that. Next slide. What, of course, was missing was that zero to four, and um, they inadvertently didn't know, or they were being mischievous and knew, but just wanted to really make the point. There are other graphs and trends that you can learn about. Um, and, and there you need to know about the levels of data. And here on step one is the levels of data. So if you're working with nominal data or ordinal data or interval data or ratio data, you can only perform certain statistical tests on them. So um, if you didn't know what statistical tests you performed on what level of data, you might inadvertently bring me an average for ordinal data, which is impossible. You can't do that. Um, again, you have no idea how many times people present <laughs> the wrong statistics because they haven't really fully understood the data. Step two there is time value of money, and we use that to do a lot of the modeling. And step three would be measures of central, central tendency and variability, how, how much does the data vary by? And their standard deviations are good. And step four, we teach you how to pick up discrimination. Do you pay men more than women? Do you pay different, uh, do you pay marketing more than HR or finance, uh, for example, or is it the other way around? So um, we, we show you how to do that. That talks to the quantitative, in other words, statistics. So that would be the second course, GR2. This one is IFRS, uh, the second one. Uh, the third one will be international remuneration. And IFRS helps you talk to the finance people. So for example, there are 52 different financial reporting standards. In this course, we talk about two of them. IAS 19, which is employee benefits, and IFRS 2, which is share-based payments. That's what you're reading in front of you. But more importantly, we cover the framework. Next slide. And the framework, uh, there you can see IAS 19 on the extreme right. We cover that because that shows you what um, the various elements are of how accountants report. 
So we've got words like total direct compensation, total package, total remuneration, total indirect compensation. Um, but the accountants have got one word for it. And their word is employee benefits finished. So they've got one line, <laughs> one line in the annual financial statements called the employee benefits. And very often HR folk look at it and say, you know, but where's everything else? Um, well, it's all in that one line. Next slide. Yes, it helps you talk to your finance colleagues. I think the finance colleagues have done a good job of keeping up with our nomenclature and definitions. Um, and this course is an opportunity for you to try and talk some of their language. Next slide. This is the globally famed conceptual framework of IFRS. Um, every single accountant that ever studies accountancy has to memorize this conceptual framework. By the end of this course, you will have memorized it and you will know absolutely everything about all of that. Under level two elements, we talk about the main financial statements, which um, is uh, the income statement, balance sheet, cash flow, and owner's equity. So we um, give you a refresher there. From an IFRS point of view, there are slight definitions differences between IFRS and what you learned at university in standard accounting. For example, assets, there are two requirements for you to be able to call it an asset under IFRS. And we'll cover things like that. So you, you'll, you'll be pretty, pretty au fait with the lingo and you'll be at least on par from a conversation point of view, the next finance meeting you attend. Next slide. Here are the four main financial statements, and most of us don't know what links the income statement to the balance sheet. We don't understand the metrics well enough, and we design all these fancy short-term and long-term schemes, but we don't know where to report them in here. And this course shows you exactly where you report it. And as a matter of interest, if you're a factory worker, you are reporting under cost of goods sold. Um, and if you're a salaried and staff, you report it somewhere else. And um, I think it just helps us understand a bit better where compensation gets reported and how it gets reported. Profit that moves across from the income statement to the balance sheet is uh, retained earnings. And retained earnings is shown in the um, shareholders' equity, and that's where your shares come from, for your executive share plan. We call them treasury shares, and uh, you can either buy them on the open market or make them available from there, but they come out of there. Dividends also come out of there. And uh, most folk don't really realize that. So um, a very, very handy course. And it's the, the second one that I'm covering today. Next slide. This shows the four main categories that ISU. So employee benefits is the overall name that's shown and here, are the four main classifications, so short-term benefits, post-employment, long-term, and termination. What's very, very interesting is the long-term benefits where we talk about retirement funds and we talk about um, defined contribution, defined benefit. And uh, in, in the MENA region, you've got nice hybrid plans uh, and some of the countries have got caps at uh, 45K. Um, very, very interesting. Um, area to explore in your own countries. Next slide. IFRS 2 is the last chapter of um, this course. Uh, it talks about share-based payments. And if you're interested in shares and if you want to really make it to the very top of being a compensation expert, then you would do well to understand share plans. There's a fork in the road. You've got equity settled and cash settled, and most of them fall under equity settled. The next fork in the road there would be a full share or an option share or a share appreciation. And uh, we cover all the metrics, the financial metrics that you need to um, for the shares to vest. In other words, total shareholder return, earnings per share, uh, return on capital, things like that. And, and I go through and or the tutor, it might not be me. There are many tutors. One of the tutors will go through um, ESG, for example. How does ESG metrics tie into the long-term incentive? Because it's now weighted between 10 and 20% of the weightings. 
You'll also get um, a feel for which um, models to use to value shares. Um, we cover Black Shoals, Binomial, and Monte Carlo. And um, very, very interesting if you're interested in shares. And if you want to make comp and Ben or total reward your career, your thing, then um, you need to understand long-term incentives. Next slide. The third um, course out of the 10 courses that we picked, um, just maybe because they're the most interesting ones and just to give you a feel for what's covered in the courses, uh, one hour is too short to talk about 10 courses, but um, the top three, international remuneration, most organizations are trying to globalize in one way or another. Even if it's suppliers or contractors or selling your product, um, one needs to understand uh, the global landscape. And this course helps you with that. Next slide. Talent acquisition is um, a global thing now. I mean, I travel to the MENA region and in all the various countries that I'm in, I'm absolutely amazed at the number of expatriates and international uh, people, uh, honestly. In, in Singapore, um, where I spend a lot of time as well, they, they've got 3 million Singaporeans and 3 million expatriates. So it's um, nearly half the country, more than half. And in some of the MENA regions, you know, you've got 10 times the number of expatriates as locals. So uh, I, I find that absolutely fascinating. Uh, in my country, the expatriates make up a very small proportion. Nevertheless, many of the people in my country go to other countries so if you're going from a, a soft currency like Thailand, Vietnam, um, Johannesburg, Cape Town to London, New York, uh, Riyadh, you know, how should you adjust the pay? Similarly, if you're going from Dubai and Riyadh and other countries in the MENA region and you want to send people to London, New York and Tokyo and Sydney, um, how should you adjust their pay? Um, this course answers that question. Next slide. Next slide, please. Um, we're all working together, and I don't know where all of you are from, but I would bet that you've got at least five different countries online. I bet you we've got five different countries. Um, I know for sure that there's at least five different countries online. And that means we are working from anywhere. We like that 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 fella <laughs> sitting with a laptop. It doesn't matter where you are sitting these days. Uh, you work from anywhere. So work is not a place anymore. Yes, I do understand. People are starting to go back to the office and uh, CEOs want people back in the office. I get it completely. But um, a lot of people don't want to go back to the office and you need them. So what do you do? Um, we, under this course, cover that quite extensively. And uh, the next slide will show us a bit more detail. Next slide. Uh, one back. The, the map. Yes, thank you very much. Um, very, very interesting. So if you took Atlanta in the USA at $100,000, and you took the PPP, the purchasing power parity, or the, the cost of living in various places, you can see generally in the MENA region, you are a bit cheaper than, um, than, than, than Atlanta in the USA. Tokyo at, at 185 is a lot more expensive. And um, where, where I am, Cape Town, 58,000, uh, I'm sitting in Johannesburg, but there is no Johannesburg there. Cape Town is uh, 58,000. What happened is um, during COVID, a lot of the international universities would try and find lectures to lecture, and they found me at half the price of, or a third of the price what they paying their lectures, and the quality is identical. So there was a huge shift of who was doing work where around the world. The tax authorities have a conundrum. They don't know where to tax you. So they, they're still trying to work out, you know, I'm getting paid from 10 or 20 different countries. Um, they, they, they 
kind of don't know how to get the tax right. But eventually they will get the tax right and then it won't matter anymore. But in the Maldives, 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 there, uh, just above on the Indian Ocean there, underneath India, um, there are thousands, hundreds of thousands of workers from all over the world just chilling there and uh, working and earning their salary. Because it's very, very cheap to live there if you don't drink alcohol. So um, that's the only thing that's very expensive there. But if you if you just wanted to live normally, you could live at half the price of anywhere else on this map. Next slide. There's um, a lot of talk around what footprint your business has. And most of us use these words interchangeably, but from a HR and a comp and band point of view, these words have got a very specific meaning. So if you could, at the very top of export picture, you are national. In other words, you are a local company, you're national. Then you get export orientated, which means you're national, but you're exporting to two or three or four countries. Then you are international, multinational, and global. And global would be um, Microsoft, Google, Toyota. Multinational would be companies like um, uh, Samsung, uh, Pfizer, Johnson & Johnson. And international would probably be um, IKEA, Walmart, you know, the retail chains. Now, if you're doing benchmarking with your... Um, salary survey service provider and you are a national company or export but you've picked all the global companies and you come and present your 20 or 30 companies to me and you're telling me that you're paid half of what they've been paid and you all need a big pay increase the first question i'm going to ask you is this one can you show me the geographic footprint have you inadvertently by mistake picked every single multinational and global company for your um, sample. Well, if you have, uh, you might have made a mistake, but if you did it on purpose, either way, I'm going to be sending you out the room and go and pick companies of similar size, complexity, and footprint. So, for example, if you were an international company, you can pick 10 companies in export, 10 internationals, and 10 multinationals. That's a fair spread of companies then I'm more likely to accept your um, your survey results just to uh, give you a feel for how one should be using this. When you're benchmarking any HR practice, um, you can't sometimes benchmark across these geographic footprints. Next slide, please. And the reason you can't is that um, things are different. So this slide is an attempt to show you uh, what is different and why is it different. Uh, I'm not going to read it out to you. You're welcome to the slides from my point of view. I don't mind at all. Um, and if you attend the course, then one goes into this in um, a lot more detail. But um, it also tells you where what's centralized and what's decentralized and what um, should be done by the holding company and what should be done by the um, host country, what should be done by the home country. If you've got third country nationals, what is it that you do? And it differs depending on where you are. And we may not be aware of that. So on this course, you'll learn all about the various geographic footprints and how to deal with your Comp and Ben program. Next slide. You might also not know that uh, when you look at a cellular survey, um, you might be in Singapore, for example, on 13 checks, 13 monthly salaries. In other words, January to December, and in one of the months, let's say December, uh, you get an additional check, 13. If you are benchmarking against Japan and you didn't know that they had up to 21 checks, 21, I mean, it's insane. If, if, if you join the company, it's one could be on your anniversary, one could be on your birthday, one is on the CEO's birthday, one is on the company's birthday, one is the president's birthday, his Majesty's birthday, and so on and so on. Um, you, you may not know that you've got to take that number and multiply it by 21 instead of 12, which is what uh, a lot of the MENA countries do. Um, you're not there yet. So I would encourage you all as well to participate in the World at Work um, 
uh, salary survey. It's, it's not a survey where they give you numbers. It's a pay increase survey. So um, that way we can start getting good data. It's free, by the way, free, 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 free. Speak to any one of the colleagues that you're in touch with there um, and, and you give them your data. It can be anonymous, no problem. And um, you get back free data. Next slide. I'm getting near the end of this and um, then I'll be um, handing back. So there's just a couple more slides on the international. Uh, it is 20 to the hour um, in my country, it's 1540, which means we've got about another 20 minutes. So I'd like to leave some um, time for questions and then there's a few wrap up slides. So just forgive me then for spending a bit of time on this slide. Uh, I find it one of the most interesting ones and it's a very quick way of getting up and running with um, moving people across territories. So we do have enough time for me to just spend a bit of time here. On the left, top left, you can see one, two, three, and then you've got your table. So if your home base salary is 750,000, less your tax, you've got a home net salary of 443. Of course, I'm rounding. I'm only reading the first three numbers. Internationally, most times it's split between essential spending in the host country and about 60% is left in the home country. So on the right is your home country, your net balance is 266. There's an international premium of 225, which is 30% of the 750 home base salary. That's for flights, containers, storage, and uh, what's left at home is 491 on the right. Then on the left, you'd normally get housed. So you might get an apartment or a flat. You might get, uh, if you go to Angola or Afghanistan, um, you'll get a Land Rover and a driver. Um, and 40% of your money would be essential spending. You multiply that by the cost of living index. And in my example, it's 1.46 multiplied by the exchange rate. And in my example, SNP uh, is fictitious. It's a supernova peso. And um, let's say the exchange rate is 7.12. You multiply it out. And in your host, current, host country currency, you'd get 1.8 million supernova peso. Um, and that's how you equalize it. And that's why it's called the balance sheet approach. And this approach is used by 80% or 90% of organizations around the world. Um, we cover this in the international remuneration uh, part. And um, there are some exceptions to this. Um, airline pilots, for example, when you fly air airplanes, um, there it's an international market and we use the IME international market approach and um, the, a, a, a 747 pilot can fly any plane and, and an Airbus pilot can fly any plane. They are identical and it doesn't matter which country you're flying for. So there's a war for pilots after COVID. When COVID came, half the pilots around the world were entrenched. And now we are all starting to fly again and the pilots are now farmers and plumbers and started their own business. And um, there, there's a shortage of pilots, which has pushed, pushed the price up. Very, very interesting to keep in touch with international dynamics. Okay, next slide. And this is the last formal slide that I'm going to show you. I'd like to just summarize briefly by saying that um, there are 10 uh, uh, GRP courses. Uh, the ones that are tutor-led or online is fine. It doesn't matter which you do. Um, the tutor will take you through it, explain it carefully, make sure that you can clear the exam, uh, make sure that you understand it well enough to apply back at home at your company. Um, we went through three out of the 10. I, we just picked them randomly. It, it was quantitative, which is statistics, um, the, the IFRS, financial reporting, and international REM. But they're all interesting. Um, we just happened to pick three. Uh, if there's enough interest, I'm very happy to run another webinar where um, we can pick another three. And I'm quite happy to pick another three and, and do exactly the same thing. Uh, just tell you a bit about it, but also share some interesting facts and fun facts and um, give you a small takeaway. Hopefully um, 
you are interested enough then to actually come and join some of the classes. Um, international remuneration is going through hell at the moment because of transparency, equal pay for work of equal value. Companies in Europe having to, by law, um, put the top five individuals pay and the bottom person's individuals pay uh, and managing the pay gap ratio by law. That's called the vertical pay gap and the horizontal pay gap, men and women, by law. So it's um, very, very interesting from my point of view. Obviously, um, um, I watch it very, very closely and uh, I enjoy reading some of the court cases and some of the uh, ways that companies go about addressing this. So that's a whirlwind tour through uh, three out of the 10 GRP courses. I hope some of it was interesting and piqued your interest. Uh, I'll gladly take some questions, but before I do, I'd just like to hand back to Mega, um, who can uh, talk through the last one or two slides, and then we can open up for questions. Thank you for listening, and I'll check you in a moment. Thank you so much, Dr. Mark. That was very informative. I'm not even a compensation or an HR professional, but you really, really made the subject quite simple to understand. Now, before we open up for questions, I'd like to share some of the courses that are coming up. Informa Connect Academy is the only provider for in-house, in-person courses in the Middle East. Our courses are delivered in Dubai, or you can even attend them virtually if you like. Um, you will see here that the courses are coupled with each other. So we have two modules at one, uh, sorry, just give me a moment, please. Yeah, so you have two modules um, in one week in a span of four days. Um, uh, with the exception of the job analysis course, which is a four day course by itself. And we look forward to helping you with your registrations and to welcoming you on the courses. Um, let's open the floor to questions now. Um, just checking the chat. I don't see any questions as of now. Please feel free to type them in. All right, we have one question. So that I'm just gonna I'm just gonna speak them out for you, Dr. Mark. Which role do, do the financial organizations play in offering guidelines on fiscal policies and which procedures should someone put in consideration while making investments? Wow, that's a real question for you. Joseph, I think you win the prize for the best question. <laughs> so, um, it 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 it's it can be a short or a long answer. Let let me let me start with a short one, and if that doesn't uh, suffice, then we can move to the long one. So financial organisations will typically give a forecast on CPI and inflation rates and PPIs, producer price indices that companies use to set their um, pay increases for the next year, it's because most companies would try and um, match their pay increase and match the salary and wage will going up relative to the uh, inflation rate. Um, and, and all the financial organizations publish it uh, a year in advance and some even project it for uh, two or three years. And that helps with the planning of that onus salary and wage bill, which most folk are trying to tie to the fortunes of the business. So even though the fixed pay is going up by that financial organization's uh, inflation rate, um, they are trying to leverage it. They're trying to make the variable pay much more highly geared so that they're not so hell-bent on giving this um, fixed pay uh, massive increases. The second part of your question is slightly different. Um, which procedures should someone put in place while making investments? Well, it depends on whether you are investing as an individual or as a company. So for individuals, I can tell you for sure that there's three um, pillars of investment. One is cash, land, and shares on the stock exchange. So you, you, you should have a portfolio that has one third, one third, one third. That's the gold standard. Of course, if you're more risk averse, you'd get more land and cash. And if you don't mind risk, you'd get more shares. Organizations that make investments, well, they, they try to maximize their return to their shareholder. 
So whatever is going to give them the biggest return to the shareholders is what they're going to do. And that's where financial organizations play a big role because you go to the financial organization to borrow the money. That's if you're not listed. If you're listed, you can do an IPO and you can get more money and you can um, reissue shares, no problem, and you can do your investment. But it's whatever gives you the biggest return. Now, they're two completely different strategies when it comes to that from a company point of view. Number one is you can invest in a company that the share price is just growing like anything. And, and Apple is a good example. There are no dividends um, at all. Um, General Mills, for example, is a very flat single digit growth company. Their dividend policy is one in five. So for every one dollar they take back, they give five out. So what would you consider when making investments is um, whether it's going to be a, a high growth share or a high dividend company? A very, very interesting question, very broad. I hope um, I hope I covered some of that. Uh, you're welcome to to rephrase the question if I missed it. But a very, very good question. Thank you. Could you type in there what industry you're in, Joseph? Are you from a financial services organization? Yeah, that would be helpful. Um, what is the, the next question is, I think it's from Faison. What is the minimum experience and position in HR is required to exactly qualify or fit for understanding the course? And then he continues, the IFRS learning in this course is exactly the same as finance, or is it different? Okay, that's a much easier question. Thank you for that. <laughs> uh, so let me answer your first one. Um, these courses are designed that you don't need a lot of experience and you don't need prior qualifications. So this could be your qualification if you left school and you've got some experience and um, your mathematics was relatively okay, then you would clear the exams and you would benefit from the courses in terms of learning, no problem. Um, in At World at Work, you've got 10 GRP courses where IFRS is one of them, but then there's another two courses where if you do finance and, and, and law, you get what's called the CCP, your certified compensation professional. It's um, and there it's it's a finance course, and that finance course and IFRS um are completely different. Completely, there's um about a fifteen to twenty percent overlap, and the fifteen to twenty percent overlap is the four uh, financial statements. So there is overlap on income statement, balance sheet, cash flow, and owner's equity, but um the focus of the courses are completely different. So you would need to do both. So you mainly work in the HR domain, but you do have accounting overview. Yeah, so you may not learn anything, but um, but if you want the qualification, then you do it for the qualification, you know, not for learning. So we often have experts in finance coming. Uh, they they clear the financial part very well, but struggle with the HR. And the HR folk clear the HR pieces very well, but struggle with the finance. Um, it just depends why you want to do it. But it's not just about the course. I think it's about meeting people. So in a class, you might have 5, 10, 15 people um, from different industries, and it's listening to them uh, give experiences in their companies. How do they deal with things? So it's it's not only the course material. Um, the other thing is that the tutors landed. They landed in a country. So in front of you, you can see you've got Agnes and Basma and Robert. Um, they, they, they've got slightly different experience from me. I mean, they live in different places and they're going to land it um, for you. Um, so so it's, it's quite a good idea to get different experiences from different people. I hope I've answered that. Your question is about self-study. Can you buy the material? Look, I think there you need to speak with um, Mega and Asil. I'll hand that question over to you. Um, 
sale, Mega, do you want to cover that or do you want me to just give a brief can overview you, of what happens? Now we can. I think you yeah. Go ahead, Mega, if you'd like to cover this. Okay, sure. Uh, yes, uh, the World at Work website will allow you to purchase material by, uh, and, and do self-study by yourself. Uh, there are other online uh, resources that are available on the World at Work website, which you can explore as well. Yes, we do have, we have had uh, candidates um, wishing to study on their own as well, and they have gone down that route. So the short answer yeah. is yes, but... Can, can I make a proviso? Sorry about that. I'll just make one proviso. Out of the 12 courses, if you take CCP or the 10 courses, if you take GRP, some are easier, some are in the middle, and some are difficult. It's very, very hard to clear um, some of the more difficult ones with self-study. You know, I would not recommend doing the more difficult ones with self-study. So... Um, the easier ones are um, GR9, which is communication, GR3, which is job description and job evaluation, GR4 is relatively easy, GR17, market pricing, relatively easy. But once you get to the CCP ones, um, finance and regulatory environment and uh, IFRS, T7, um, I, I, honestly, I wouldn't, I wouldn't attempt them on your own. I, I think you need tutor input. It's got nothing to do with your intellect. It's got nothing to do with whether you studied finance or not. It's it's the nuances in the course book. Okay, we've answered that question. Asil, did you want to come in? I very, very um, rudely cut you off. Sorry. No, I think both you and Mega covered it all. But just for candidates to know that there are three learning approaches to learn that work. One, which is the e-learning study, where you purchase materials from the website directly. The other is a virtual course. And in our region, we have Informa and UAE that can provide you with a virtual course that you wish to attend on the online. Also, there's the in class. Also, Informa provides you with the in class, where there is an instructor tutoring the course as well. It happens that the course is Pyplex, which is a blended approach, online and classroom approach at the same time, but you can choose whatever you are more comfortable with and attend with Informa Connect. Yeah, mainly that's everything from my end. Please, uh, Dr. Mark or Mega, you can go ahead. Thank you. I'm just looking uh, for questions. I don't see any coming in now. So I guess we should wrap up then, and we are well in time. Okay, right, so yeah. last last call, last call for any questions. If anyone wants to know anything or wants to ask a final question, you may be a bit shy, but um, now you've plucked up the courage. <laughs> no, <laughs> all right. Thank you very, very much for attending. And uh, to the teams that put all of this together, thank you very, very much. You are all quintessential professionals. Well done. Thank you so much. And thank you, everyone, for joining us. We hope you found this useful. And we look forward to working with you towards your GRP journey. All the very best. Thank you. Bye-bye. What if you and your team can be even more? Even more informed, competitive, accomplished, even more successful with programs designed to inspire and empower everyone to become even more. Introducing Informa Connect Academy with hundreds of global, digital, and in-person training courses led by world-renowned industry experts, reimagining learning experiences for even more unlocked potential. InformaConnect Academy, available at informaconnect.com slash academy.